so we were just uh, kind of near the end of topic 12. And so what I wanted to do was kind of just finish off talking about a couple of things, one being E. coli, and the second thing being uh, just talking a little bit about disease progression. So let's get into that. And uh, let's talk about E. coli. So I'd finished off, I think I finished off on this slide here. And I had uh, showed you this slide way before. And uh, so, um, sorry, somebody just has a comment. Um, oh, it says they were due at 5 a.m. according to Moodle. Okay, well, that is uh, that was a mistake on my end. No, it tells me what time you handed it in. So they're due 5 p.m. today. Um, so, uh, yeah, don't worry about that. I will see what time it was actually handed in. And I mean, if you hand it in at 5.05 p.m. or something like that, it's not really a big deal. I'm not planning on grading them tonight. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about E. coli. Someone's asking if they can add something to theirs. You certainly can. Uh, like I said, I'm just getting in today. That'd be great. Okay, back to E. coli. Uh, sorry for the interruption there. Uh, so I left off on this slide. We had seen this slide before. I mentioned that E. coli, uh, there's many strains out there. Uh, most of them are good for us. There's a few nasties out there. Some are opportunistic pathogens. So uh, like the uh, uropathogenic E. coli, they're just getting into the wrong place. They're getting into your urethra or your bladder, causing an uncomfortable infection, uh, which is kind of true of a lot of opportunistic infections. Uh, but there are a few strains out there and you can see they have some fancy acronyms, the ETEC and the EPEC, that are actually pathogenic. And so I want to talk about them, why those strains are pathogenic and other strains are not pathogenic. So uh, this is kind of just a uh, slide sort of summarizing up what we were just talking about. Uh, you can get urinary tract infections, you can get gastrointestinal infections. Those are kind of the common type of E. coli infections. And E. coli can cause all sorts of uh, opportunistic infections which uh, includes many, many body systems. So uh, you can get pneumonia from E. coli. It's kind of rare, but it happens if you get E. coli in the wrong place. You can see sepsis, wound infections, et cetera, all sorts of other infections. So the ones that uh, usually come up in terms of pathogenesis usually have these, um, these acronyms. You can see they all end up with EC, which is E. coli. So ETEC is enteropoxygenic, for example and enteropathogenic and enterohemorrhagic. So they're describing something about the, uh, the pathology of these E. coli. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you, uh, you know, which acronym goes with which E. coli and all that, but I do wanna overview uh, some of the uh, characteristics about these and kind of talk a little bit about uh, the pathogenesis and uh, there's some common things around them and some, some differences around them as well. So uh, we take a look at uropathogenic E. coli. I think I showed you this slide maybe before uh, when we were talking about urinary tract infections. And I'd mentioned this is really the case where the E. coli is getting into the wrong place. And uh, it's not every strain that can do this. Only some strains uh, can do this. Uh, and, uh, and they have a certain uh, pili called a P. fimbriae or P. pili that can actually bind to urinary tract cells. So sometimes it's called hymenor cystitis because uh, uh, some women, uh, when they become sexually active, uh, they start getting urinary tract infections. And this is because uh, just due to anatomy, the urethra, the vagina and anus are all kind of close. And uh, so I think I'd mentioned before, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, health guides will suggest that women uh, after sexual activity urinate just to kind of uh, clear the urethra just in case any bacteria got in there. So we want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, uh, enteropathogenic E. coli, which means, of course, the digestive system. But like I said, I want to talk a little bit about all of these as to why they're pathogenic. And you can see right here, we have a virulence factor. So that's why not all E. coli can do this. They need to have some sort of virulence factor to, to give them some pathogenicity. So here's, uh, here's kind of this, uh, this list of a whole bunch of them. They're, you know, depending on, on the source, you can see sometimes they have slightly different acronyms. But a couple of things I want to point out, right? Symptoms, okay? Pretty much diarrhea, right? Sometimes the diarrhea has blood in it, sometimes not. Uh, why do we sometimes have bloody diarrhea? Uh, sometimes they have certain uh, toxins. So you can see this one here. It has a Shiga toxin. 
and uh, that particular toxin actually causes an inflammation of the bowel, and that's uh, causing destruction of those cells in there, which uh, are going to, uh, of course, are going to bleed. Um, other toxins are just causing an imbalance in the way that water and, and salts are transported across membranes. And so, of course, if you end up with excess water, uh, uh, if you end up with excess water in the bladder, then you can end up with, um, or extra water, sorry, in the, um, in the intestine, then you're going to end up with, uh, with diarrhea, right? So this is why they're classified as, as different, because they have different uh, virulence factors. So this is more important to, uh, you know, scientists and people who are tracking such things. Uh, just point out some of the virulence factors. Some of them have pili that allow them to attach to things. Uh, a lot of them have enterotoxins. So like I said, enterotoxins are usually uh, um, causing diarrhea by allowing extra fluids into the gut. So remember entero. Entero means gut. So we have enterococcus. It lives in your gut. Enterotoxins are toxins that do something with your gut. And they're usually doing something uh, around diarrhea. So uh, a couple of questions here. Somebody says, is EPEC the only E. coli that leads to bladder infections? It's, it's uh, actually uh, um, not the ETEC. You can see it's called UPEC. So UPEC, urinary pathogenic uh, E. coli, is the one. There's probably others. Uh, but my understanding is the ones that cause urinary tract infections is only about 10 known strains. So it's actually not a lot. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more. Uh, usually they're not diagnosed and checking out exactly which strain it is. And, uh, you know, if it gets into the wrong place, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to cause trouble. So let's just take a look at some of these. I, I want to point out a couple of uh, common things around them. Um, one of the most common ones that people get is uh, this enterotoxigenic E. coli that causes traveler's diarrhea. So lots and lots of people have had this. Um, go to a place. Uh, where the sanitation isn't quite as good. I think I've got a map here. Let me just take a look here. Yeah, here's a map, right? So you travel to uh, a lot of those countries in the red zone. So Mexico is a common one where you travel to Mexico and they say, please don't drink tap water. And, um, you know, if you go to a resort, um, it's pretty common uh, if you go along the beach, sometimes to see little pipes sticking out and literally it's human sewage coming out of those pipes. Um, they're just not there yet in terms of their sanitation water treatment. And uh, so we're looking at E. coli past in human feces. Uh, people get sick, sometimes violently so, rarely life-threatening, usually only lasts a couple of days, um, but can make for an unpleasant vacation if that happens too. So there's also EPEC. This one is a little bit more um, serious. Uh, this is also past in human feces, and this is a common cause of diarrhea in children in developing countries. Um, you can see, see the diagram I have there. Uh, you know, if you go on Google, again, a warning, a warning. If you go on Google, you may get what you, you look for if you're looking for human images, right? I didn't want to Google diarrhea, because you could only imagine, but I found something a little more interesting. So this is a common cause of, of death of children in, in uh, poor countries, by the way, which is unfortunate. There's also EHEC. This is the one that we hear about in Canada. Uh, this is the one that when you hear about E. coli in the news, uh, because generally our water supplies are not getting contaminated with human feces. That doesn't happen so often in Canada. It happens sometimes. Um, you, you know, you can imagine people with wells and, and septic fields and all sorts of, you know, scenarios where that may happen. What's more common scenario is that uh, our water or food Get contaminated with with feces from animals and so this is the one here e coli 0157 this is the uh, most famous one uh, that uh, causes uh, diarrhea but this is usually a pretty nasty kind of bloody diarrhea and you can see from the cow that popped up that it is common in cows uh, i was looking at one study they uh, surveyed uh, a thousand cows and half of those cows were carriers uh, other studies show less. So the point is that a lot of cows have this E. coli and it doesn't make the cows sick. Uh, but this is the one we hear about in the news. There was that, um, was it last year? There was the massive uh, romaine lettuce uh, uh, recall and it was E. coli 0157. Uh, you can see somebody's uh, referring to a spinach recall with that Popeye can. And uh, I saw some sprouts getting recalled uh, 
a few months ago, I don't think it was in Canada, but there was a major sprout recall for O. E. coli 157. So like I said, this one's really nasty. Uh, it causes bloody diarrhea, and if you are particularly young or old, uh, you can die from this uh, and, uh, because you're getting uh, basically a bacterial infection in the blood, which can, uh, can be very, very serious, some, so some sepsis. Um, there is a little video there. I'm not going to show you the video. Um, uh, it kind of just uh, results in uh, a, a diagram that you see on the end, but uh, these, these organisms do some really weird things. Uh, they basically bind to your intestinal cells, and then they form this thing here that uh, the scientists are calling pedestals. Uh, they should just call them toilets, because what they're doing is kind of restructuring the cell and dumping all their waste products into those cells, and then those cells are going to die, and that's causing a bloody diarrhea. Like I said, the real risk is when the bacteria gets into the bloodstream, and uh, if you are immunocompromised, uh, particularly young people or old people, uh, we're looking at death in, in many cases, or at least very severe illness. And it's very hard to treat. Uh, this is the kind of thing, once you get it in your blood, you don't want to necessarily give the person a lot of antibiotics because uh, that's going to cause the endotoxins get released, and the endotoxins will cause uh, septic shock, which is, we don't want that either. So uh, usually they're treating the symptoms and giving people fluids and hoping the immune system will clear it eventually. And uh, of course, if you don't have a strong immune system, that can be very bad for you. Uh, this was a while ago now. Imagine some of you were not even born in the year 2000, but I was in Ontario at the time, and this was a big deal. Um, it was called the Walkerton Water Crisis or Tragedy, where uh, there was uh, a town of Walkerton. It's a small community farming area. And uh, my understanding is there was kind of a flood, and we had a cow manure that ended up in, in a water a reservoir for the town. And uh, there are a whole bunch of things around this in that the people doing the water testing were not um, uh, properly trained and they had falsified some reports and now they're actually in jail because uh, I think it was something like 1,800 people got sick and there were, uh, I, I don't know, remember the number of deaths, but they were, uh, they were certainly in the dozens, I believe, uh, maybe two dozen deaths. Um, so really, really sad. And, and we've learned a lot more about E. coli 157 since because of, of course, this tragedy. So um, this is just from your textbook right in the very first chapter. They're, they're just talking about uh, different types of diseases that are serious. And you can see some of the risks here on the right. Um, so it can be found in ground meat, which is why you should cook your meat. Um, can be found in other foods, uh, water. Surprising, they don't, have, um, they don't have vegetables there because it does happen once in a while. And uh, it's not found in all meat. This has actually, because of 0157, we've uh, changed our slaughterhouse practices in Canada and, and, and reduced this greatly, but there is always the risk with uncooked meat, of course. You can see on the left, it's talking about how it can cause all sorts of issues besides diarrhea. It can also cause uh, urinary tract infections, bladder infections, and, and uh, if it gets in the blood, you know, blood clots and, and all sorts of nasty things. So this is why E. coli gets the bad press. So there's all those strains of E. coli out there that are either doing us good or causing us some minor inconveniences, like some bad diarrhea for a couple of days, and then there's the one that can kill you. Some people are arguing that this is, uh, if you look at the genetics of this thing, that uh, it has, uh, like if you look at normal E. coli, normal E. coli has about 4,400 genes. This has almost, I think, around eight or 900 extra genes. So some people are saying, well, is this actually even E. coli, or should we give it another name? So we'll see, maybe in the future, uh, this will be given another name, and, uh, but we'll see. Okay, so I want to finish off this topic, uh, just talking about disease a little bit. Um, there's a lot of definitions I could throw in here, you know, talking about acute and chronic disease uh, and, and those kind of things. Um, I think some of them are in the notes. You can take a look at them. I'm not going to go over all those definitions, uh, but I just want to talk a little bit about the stages of disease. Because uh, this is something that has come up a lot with the coronavirus uh, epidemic that we're, uh, we're experiencing right now. And there's been a lot of talk about particularly this thing here, which is the incubation period. So the incubation period is where you get infected. And uh, you don't quite have enough microbes or enough of immune response to show symptoms yet. So uh, this, is, um, this is from the textbook, although I threw in the one for COVID-19. Um, I think I covered up uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which probably none of us are going to get. Uh, 
Um, and you can see some diseases very, very quickly. Cholera and salmonella, uh, those are infecting the gut and uh, very quickly, usually within a day you're getting symptoms kind of thing, right? E. coli, diarrhea, for some reason a little bit slower, not really sure why that is. You can see some diseases, um, the incubation period can last many days. So for COVID-19, the incubation period, I think uh, kind of the average for most people is in the two to three day range, uh, where you spend two to three days with those symptoms and then you get disease. Uh, but overall, if you look at uh, um, uh, like the literature from Alberta Health, they're saying one to 14 days. And uh, that's, uh, that's based on the data. Like I said, most people are kind of in the two to three range, but uh, there's enough people that are up to 14 days which is why if you're exposed to somebody, which is why they're asking you to, um, to self-isolate for 14 days, just in case, um, because uh, you know, we're trying to prevent the spread of this thing. So incubation period is something that's, that's uh, very important, obviously, when we're looking at um, uh, epidemics or pandemics, because uh, we're trying to nip these off. And uh, unfortunately for COVID-19, uh, it can be quite long, which makes this thing very, very good at spreading in the human population. As, um, as we all know um, with this pandemic going on right now. So usually people start getting some symptoms and uh, it's, it's not necessarily this simple and I'll show you why that is in a moment. And uh, you know, at some point it's going to get relatively severe and it's either going to get better or the person is going to, you know, or they may die from it, right? And so it kind of depends on uh, what happens there at the, at the most severe stage of the illness. And then there's decline and, and then hopefully no symptoms in the end. Obviously, this doesn't cover all diseases. Some diseases are chronic and the symptoms are ongoing for, for many years and those kind of things. I'm thinking of something like tuberculosis uh, and, and whatnot, but uh, kind of a general uh, graph that people think about when they're thinking about diseases. I'll show you the COVID-19 one here. Uh, this was uh, published by Daniel Griffin. Griffin. He is an MD, PhD in New York and uh, he is one of the world experts on treating people with COVID-19 and he made this graph and very nicely published it on Twitter. I don't think he's published it in the literature yet. And this is from, you know, uh, he will tell you this is from millions of observations. He's not just talking about his own, own patients, but uh, the interesting thing here is you can see the incubation period. So he says uh, uh, two to 14 days, so slightly different, but you can see they're, they're saying that, uh, um, He's looking at the disease really having two to three stages, kind of depending on how you look at it. And so he's talking about the viral replication period or the viremia stage. So in the case of, uh, of, of COVID-19, the first uh, you know, 10-ish days, um, maybe seven days, again, depending on, on the person, uh, we're dealing with the virus replicating. And when the virus replicates, you get symptoms that are directly related to what the virus is doing to you. So this is a respiratory virus. So you're looking at uh, a lot of people getting respiratory symptoms, so shortness of breath, the cough, those kind of things. Uh, the immune system does kick in. And, uh, uh, and so you'll probably have things like a fever and whatnot. And, uh, but the virus does get cleared for most people after several days. And so the second week of the disease is actually quite different for some people who have severe disease. Some people are ending up with uh, with all sorts of complications like blood clots and uh, um, uh, long, long lasting aches and things like that. And that is, uh, you know, at that point, the, the, um, the virus has been cleared, and, uh, but they're still dealing with ongoing symptoms, partly due to the uh, inflammation caused by the immune system that is ongoing for, uh, in some cases, several weeks. I think the average person is, is two weeks uh, who have severe disease. So, you know, like I said, it's always a lot more complicated than, than the, what they show in the textbook. But, uh, you know, it gives people lots of things to think about, uh, particularly the incubation period is what uh, is often talked about when we're trying to stop diseases. Okay, so almost done this topic. A few more things just to consider when uh, regarding infectious disease. Uh, lots of things can make the body more or less acceptable. Here are some... Um, a list of a few things here. So you can see immunodeficiencies, age, climate, weather, uh, other pre-existing conditions, you know, all those things can make people susceptible or less acceptable. Uh, genetics is kind of an interesting thing. 
Um, if you look at something like cholera, um, some people just don't get that sick, and we think it's a genetic kind of thing. And uh, you know, some people get very, very sick. I saw there was a study with COVID-19 that came out uh, recently that said uh, there's certain Neanderthal genes that some people have that make them more susceptible to uh, severe illness. So I haven't read that study, but it was in the news. Thought that was kind of interesting. So um, this is a good segue to starting to talk about the immune system, which is our next topic. And uh, so you know we're we're uh, we're looking at these uh, organisms that can cause disease. So uh, the immune system is the other end of things, right? It's how our body can prevent disease, and uh, you know it's our arsenal against these organisms. So let's switch there. And, uh, and start talking about the immune system. Uh, lifestyle, of course, too, right? You know, we're looking at things like, are you, uh, are you fit and healthy? Are you a smoker? Uh, you can imagine all the, all the things around lifestyle. Chemotherapy. Okay, so topic 13. We're gonna talk about the immune system, okay? So uh, this is, Super complicated. Now, the lucky thing for you is I know you talk a little bit about the immune system in your anatomy and physiology class. Uh, probably the focus will be a little bit different here, but at least you're hearing it in a couple of different places. And um, so let's get into this. So I've uh, broken up the immune system into three parts. So it'll be three lectures. We're gonna do part one today, which is the innate immunity. Before we talk about innate immunity, I kinda wanna talk about the complexity of the immune system and some of the parts of the immune system. So if you think about the jobs of the immune system, all the things that it has to do, right? It has to, uh, you know, kill pathogens, fight worms, uh, cause inflammation. Um, it's, uh, it has to remember an infection from a previous time and all these cells have to communicate. And so there's many jobs in the immune system and it turns out there's many, many cell types, right? And uh, we're gonna talk about some of these cell types and we're gonna talk about some of these jobs and uh, like I said, it is immensely complicated. Uh, the reality is there is a lot we do not know about the immune system. And uh, it's, it's really incredible what we have learned about the immune system since I've actually taken an immunology course. Since then, uh, we've learned so much. Uh, but there's so much that we don't know. So what I want to do uh, when we go through this unit is, is uh, if you look at the, the chapters in the textbook, um, they go into a lot more detail than I think is necessary for this course. Uh, so do uh, focus on the notes and the lectures for this, but uh, you know, obviously the textbook is a good supplement, but there are some things we're just not gonna talk about. We just don't have time to talk about the entire immune system one course. It's, uh, it's very, very complex. Uh, there's a video here you can check out. It's kind of an introduction to the, the uh, immune system and, and um, I, I like this picture because he's just showing that the immune system is, is super complex. And, uh, but it's, it's great because we've got a great immune system. So I'm gonna switch to the whiteboard. You might want a piece of paper for this. And uh, what I'm going to do is kind of draw you a little, um, I guess, chart talking about the different parts of the immune system. So I call this the immune system's three lines of defense. And uh, so I've already mentioned what we're gonna talk about today. So today we're gonna talk about innate immunity. So I'll write that down. I guess I want something better than yellow. Let's try, um, let's try black. There we go, innate immunity. So innate immunity, there we go. Okay, and so this is gonna be featured today, which is topic 13-1. And we're gonna talk about adaptive immunity. And that will be next lecture. So that will be topic 13-2. And we do have a topic 13-3, and that's where we're gonna talk about immune disorders such as uh, HIV and allergies. Um, Okay, so a couple of things about this. So what is innate immunity? Innate immunity, uh, what that means is that's what you have, it's ready right now. And uh, it's kind of your, just your natural defenses. It's not very specific. 
there's a couple of things we can say about uh, innate immunity. We can say that it is uh, nonspecific. And the other good news is that it's very fast. So fast, meaning it happens immediate or maybe even up to hours, but uh, it's something that's readily available to us uh, right now. Whereas adaptive immunity is kind of the opposite. It's very specific. So it has memory. Very specific and has memory. And it's, it's slower uh, generally. So, uh, you know, rather than minutes, we're looking at hours at the best uh, uh, and sometimes days or weeks, depending on the nature of the infection, all that. So, um, you can see my title. I guess I shrunk it a little bit somehow. Let me see. I'll, I'll, grow it. I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. It's called the three lines of defense. So I'm going to talk about three lines of defense. Uh, two of them we're going to talk about today. So the first line of defense and the second line of defense belong to innate immunity and the third line of defense belong to, belong to adaptive immunity. So what is the first line of defense? trying to get a different color for you. I'm going to get, uh, how about purple? So first line of defense, usually we're talking about mostly physical barriers. So what do we mean by that? We're talking about the skin. Yes, the skin is a huge and very important part of your immune system. If I were to choose any part of the immune system I have and have nothing else, I would definitely probably choose the skin. The, uh, uh, you know, if you don't have that, you have no immunity whatsoever. Uh, we're also going to talk about mucous membranes. And uh, something that's uh, becoming, we're realizing more and more important is our normal microbial flora. Okay, second line of defense. I need a new color for that. I'll choose green. The so second line of defense, we're talking about chemical and cellular responses. So chemical, cellular responses. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, white blood cells that can do phagocytosis. So we call those phagocytes. So I'm just gonna use phagocytic white blood cells. Uh, we're talking about some antimicrobial substances. Okay, I'm just going to shrink this a tiny bit, squeeze everything in. And uh, we're talking about certain processes. So we're mostly going to talk about inflammation and fever. So inflammation. And fever. Okay, so that is kind of like today. Let me just maybe I'll draw some lines so that it's uh, easier to see the separation. There we go. And uh, so next time we're going to talk about uh, adaptive immunity, and this includes uh, lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. So what is a lymphocyte? A lymphocyte is a T cell or a B cell, and we'll, we'll get to those next day. Lymphocytes and antibodies. So we'll say specialized. B cells and T cells and antibodies. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a kind of a context of what we're going to be talking about here. So today we're going to uh, talk about physical barriers and chemical and cellular responses. And um, just keep in mind, like I said, that uh, there's a lot um, that I could talk about. Uh, and if you go to the textbook, you're gonna see that. You're gonna see things that I'm just skipping over entirely because I just, just can't cover everything. So what I'm trying to do is kind of hit some of the, uh, 
the key things and uh, some of the things that uh, kind of related to uh, other, other concepts we've covered in the course. So like talking about uh, the microbial flora um, and those kind of things. And uh, there's a few things I might just mention very, very briefly. And if you're not sure about studying for them, let me know. I'll try to, I'll try to make it clear whether I think that's something that's important for the exam or not as well. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Here we go. The immune system is complex. And let's talk about the first line of defense. And uh, so the one thing about the first line of defense is mostly we're talking about the skin, but there are other barriers, kind of physical, um, mechanical barriers in there. And uh, if these things are compromised, of course, that is a portal of entry, right? So that's kind of important to know. If your skin is broken or you can get past the skin or, or mucous membrane, then the organism can possibly cause infection. So here's a little diagram of the skin. And uh, so the skin is made of uh, keratinized cells. And um, one thing about the skin is that those cells are kind of, um, it produces a relatively kind of flexible tissue. So, you know, mild jabs and, and uh, you know, uh, things like that, that the skin is kind of bouncy. So, uh, you know, if you have more fragile skin, so as you get older, and you make less uh, collagen, your skin gets uh, more fragile and it's easier for you to get scratches and tears and things like that, which are portals of entry. But, uh, you know, so mild jabs, not a problem. And the most outer layer is actually dead cells. And so when microbes cling to them, the cells eventually fall off and the microbes go away with them. So that's kind of good too. Uh, underneath, of course, we have living tissue where you've got sort of, um, you've got hair follicles, uh, You've got uh, blood vessels that are providing nutrients to those cells. And uh, something we're gonna talk about that's important are these here. So these dendritic cells, and they are immune cells that are kind of hovering around just below your dermis. So they're in there just underneath the surface of the, the upper surface of your skin. And they're kind of a little bit like watchdogs. So we'll come back to dendritic cells in a few minutes. So the skin of course has all sorts of secretions. And I think I mentioned this before, the skin is a little salty. That salt is in our sweat. And uh, so that, of course, makes things hypertonic or uh, takes away the water from microbes, makes it kind of dry. And so there's many microbes that don't live very well on your skin. The exceptions being the Staphylococcus and, um, and the Candida yeast, of course. Uh, those seem to like the skin. They have no problem with salt. But a lot of other organisms uh, don't live there very long, uh, depending on how salty it is. Your skin also makes uh, an oil called sebum, and that's uh, kind of a low pH, and that actually inhibits a lot of organisms as well. And so many of the organisms on your skin, they're not going to be able to live there for very long, uh, and actually many of them detected on, on skin swabs are, are already dead. So there's another kind of skin secretion, and you're gonna see a lot of these secretions are found in other parts of the body as well, like the blood and the tears, and uh, the mucous membranes, but uh, another type of secretion is called the defensin. So what is a defensin? So again, you've got that IN, right? So I told you anytime you see IN on something in biology, it usually means it's some sort of protein. So these are actually little peptides. And um, so you can see my notes there say 15 to 40 amino acids. So they're pretty short uh, peptides and they have antimicrobial properties. And uh, so this is something that we've known about for a long time. And quite honestly, the research is a little bit behind on this, but there's been hundreds now that have been discovered and uh, all sorts that have uh, really fascinating, interesting properties. Um, I was reading about, um, maybe it was a podcast. Uh, I think this was somewhere in, maybe it was Brazil. Uh, an anthropologist had gone to one of these, uh, these uh, Aboriginal communities. They're basically kind of Stone Age right, their, their hunter-gatherer kind of community. And, uh, and, and somebody had an eye infection and, and um, somebody in the village went and caught a frog and uh, cut the skin off the frog and put it on the person's eyeball, right? And, and um, they were wondering what was going on here. And I think um, uh, they had a friend, so they, they uh, you know, took the, the frog skin to their friend who was uh, some sort of, uh, uh, other kind of scientists and they, they looked into it and the frog skin had actually a whole bunch of these antimicrobial peptides in there. So it was probably some sort of, you know, medical practice that they learned that the frog skin had these uh, antimicrobial peptides, but we produce them too. Um, in terms of, you know, therapeutical use and all that, we're, we're very, very like uh, 
early on or that kind of thing. But maybe someday we'll start to have these in, in uh, you know, um, polysporin or something like that. Who knows? But basically, what are they doing? They're, uh, uh, they're interacting with the, uh, the membrane of the microbe and they're, they're causing pores and holes and things like that, which, which will kill the microbe. So the mucus secreting membranes, I mentioned these before. Uh, we're talking about the lining of, of various uh, systems like the reproductive and urinary and digestive tracts. And uh, it's lined with something called epithelium, which is a lot like skin, uh, except for it's not like multiple cell layers. I think it's one or two layers. And it's usually a lot more moist and uh, secreting um, carbohydrates and glycoproteins. And those carbohydrates and glycoproteins absorb a lot of water and moisture and become kind of sticky and we call that stuff mucus. And uh, so they're doing a lot of the same things your skin are doing, but they, they do tend to have a few more secretions that are uh, kind of contributing to, to making them protective against microbes. So I mentioned the mucus, mucus is sticky, the microbes are going to get stuck there, and in some cases the mucus is going to get expelled, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'm going to talk about lysozyme in a second, and uh, dendritic cells, and um, how some of that mucus can get expelled by your cilia in your, in your, um, in your windpipe. So we've already talked about lysozyme, or sorry, we've already talked about defensins. I want to talk about lysozyme. Uh, so lysozyme is a protein. It's found in these mucus secreting membranes. It's found in your blood. It's found in your tears. Actually, it's found in high concentration in your tears. And it's an enzyme that cuts peptidoglycan. So it just goes along like a little set of scissors and goes snip, snip. And uh, so you can see there's my peptidoglycan in that diagram. So the lysozyme is an enzyme. It cuts it up and weakens it. So one thing about lysozyme, lysozyme is actually highly effective against gram positives. So probably that makes sense if you think about it. Gram positives have that thick peptidoglycan cell wall. Gram negatives are protected by uh, that, that extra outer membrane. Uh, so gram positives are quite successful for the lysozyme. And uh, so this is why uh, a lot of um, people don't get a lot of eye infections that are uh, from gram positives. They're usually gram negatives of some sort. So let's talk about the dendritic cells. Uh, what are these things? So I told you they're a little bit like watchdogs. So they're kind of roaming around. They're roaming around like amoebas. So they can move, change the shape of their, uh, their membranes. And these are uh, phagocytic cells, which means they can do phagocytosis. So I'll talk about phagocytosis in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, we'll get there. So like I said, they kind of roam around and they kind of clean up garbage and, uh, you know, if they see things, they, they gobble them up and uh, they sometimes might alert other parts of your immune system. So I'll show you that. I've got a little cartoon here in a moment. Uh, well, actually, this isn't the cartoon I was thinking of, but you can see this one is a, just something cute calling them Rastafaris of the immune system because they kind of look like they have some fancy hair, right? So what, what do they do, right? Like I said, they're kind of like watchdogs. They, they, they roam around and uh, they will clean up debris. So in this case here, it's saying, hey, they see some, some dead cells, skin cells, maybe other rubbish, maybe bacteria, and uh, they're kind of cleaning it up, right? And uh, in this case here, it says, hey, there's some bacteria floating about. Some of those get eaten too. So eaten, meaning phagocytosis. And uh, so something it does is when it recognizes, uh, sometimes it recognizes things and uh, it can, uh, uh, um, it has a, a cellular mechanism to recognize that some of these things are bacteria, for example, and that's the time it's going to be like a watchdog. It's going to bark and it's going to recruit other parts of the immune system. So you can see here it's saying infection alert, and that's going to lead to a whole bunch of possible different processes. It might uh, cause inflammation. It might recruit histamines. It might recruit B cells and T cells. It can actually do quite a few different things. Well, like I said, think of it as a watchdog. It goes around, gobbles things up, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, sounds the alarm. And, and the alarm is a bunch of these other things that we're going to talk about uh, today and next day. So, like I said, we'll come back to the dendritic cells uh, a few times. Um, so, I mentioned the mucus can get expelled. Uh, so, how does that work? So, it turns out that all the way down our respiratory tract, we have these cilia. So these are the exact same kind of cilia that we saw in organisms that swim around. Uh, so except for in this case, rather than moving the cells, these cilia are moving fluid. 
And so this actually happens all the time. We're producing mucus constantly and we're breathing constantly. And so that mucus, we've got these little cilia and they kind of push the mucus up all the time. It just gets pushed up and uh, goes down the back of your throat. Most of the time you don't notice it uh, because the mucus is in kind of small enough quantities and you know, you, you just swallow it without noticing. Of course, when you are sick, uh, sometimes you make a lot more mucus and that's when you do notice it. It's just coming up all the time and you're coughing it out or spitting it out or swallowing it. And that's when it gets kind of gross. But this is good because we're trapping those microbes and we're getting them out of our respiratory tract. And this works very, very well because like I said, we're breathing constantly. You know, you're inhaling, uh, you know, I don't know how many times a minute. And, uh, it's, you know, the air is full of all sorts of microbes. And usually we're not getting respiratory infections, uh, you know, every single day. So this is, this is good, right? We've got this thing here called the mucal ciliary escalator. So there's a whole bunch of mechanical defenses. Um, and again, you can go and look at my notes, probably have a few more things in the textbook. There's one more that's worth mentioning, which is called the lacrimal apparatus. And uh, so what is this? It means that uh, basically you've got this gland that is constantly producing uh, a fluid that we call tears. And, uh, and that basically, you know, flushes your eyeball, keeps your eyeball moist, which is a good thing for your eye. And it will also uh, basically flush microbes away from your eye to try to keep it relatively sterile. And then it goes back and, and collects in your sinuses. So if you, do, um, if you do produce extra tears, maybe from allergies, or you've um, got some dust in your eye, or, or whatever, um, you probably know it kind of goes into your sinuses in the back of your throat. And um, so this is flushing the eyeball. One thing to note about the lacrimal apparatus is that this is also a potential uh, route of entry, right? And uh, if you have allergies, maybe you get colds a little bit more often. And the reason for that is you, you, know, you get viruses and, uh, or bacteria, your eyes are itchy, you rub your eyes. And like I said, this is a potential uh, route of entry. So this is why we need to wash our hands, particularly when there's a uh, pandemic going on because um, you know, if you have a virus on your hands and you're introducing it to your uh, respiratory passages, that's, uh, that's not a good thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, just watch when you rub your eyes. And uh, most of the time, it's not a big deal. But when there are infectious agents uh, going around, it's always a good time to, to keep, uh, uh, mind yourself of this, uh, of this potential route of entry. So what about the normal flora? We've kind of talked about this already. Uh, the normal flora protect us by occupying niches that other pathogens might uh, occupy. They produce acids, they produce bacteriosins, which are uh, antibacterial proteins, and uh, they, uh, you know, they help promote our immune system, some of the good ones too, which is, which is also helpful. So that's the first line of defense. I know that was a whirlwind tour, but like I said, I didn't want to focus on it a whole bunch. Uh, I want to uh, Kind of get through it and uh, and um, make sure that we're on schedule for the class because we still have uh, uh, a couple more units to cover and uh, the uh, the adaptive immune system is certainly a little bit more complex. So let's talk about the second line of defense and uh, again we've got a number of things that I probably won't talk about and some things I'll skip over relatively quickly uh, but the second line of defense we're talking about cells and chemicals mostly in the blood although some of these things are found kind of in other tissues that could be found in the lymph or they could be found as, uh, as secretions um, in, in other body systems. But, uh, you know, this is where they originate. So it's, it's worth it to mention the blood. So let's talk about these things. What is in the blood? So the blood, of course, is full of cells and plasma. So the plasma is basically uh, what happens when you remove the cells. It's full of water, electrolytes, nutrients that you've had, you know, whatever you just ate. Uh, and there's all sorts of proteins in there, and these proteins are involved in some of these processes we're going to talk about. So inflammation, uh, we've got antibodies, and, and all sorts of other proteins in there. So the cells, we've got our red blood cells. Those are important. We like oxygen. We're not going to talk about red blood cells so much today because we want to talk about immune cells. We've got platelets, and then we've got the immune cells, which are called, uh, a lot of people call them white blood cells because they're not colored like the red blood cells, but the scientific name is leukocytes. So 
Get familiar with that word. If you're not familiar with it, know the word leukocyte and know that it means white blood cell. I will accept both. I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether you use leukocyte or white blood cell, but you should be familiar with both. Uh, there's a similar diagram in the textbook. I like this one better because it's a lot more colorful. And you can see uh, it's talking about, you know, where all these cells come from. They come from stem cells. Then there's some differentiation. If you look way on the right, some of those cells eventually become uh, red blood cells or platelets. I have X's through them because we're not, you know, it doesn't matter about those in this class. Maybe in your anatomy and physiology class, it's important. And you can see we have uh, some differentiation differentiate into B cells and T cells. So right here and right here. And those are part of our adaptive immune response. And then we got a whole bunch of these other ones, which include, there's our dendritic cell right there and a bunch of other cells. And I kind of want to uh, talk about some of them, uh, not necessarily all of them. And those are involved, uh, many of them involved in our innate re uh, immune response. Now there's a lot of overlapping, by the way, between the adaptive immune response and the innate immune responses. I mean, we like to, you know, we're trying to organize all these things and separate them out and it makes it very handy to learn it, but it's really important to know that there's a lot of overlap between these things. So everything we talk about today in our innate immune response, keep in mind that it probably connects somehow to the adaptive immune response. And I've mentioned that already with dendritic cells that uh, they can actually uh, activate both innate and adaptive immune responses. So um, uh, like I said, lots of overlap. So here are some of those cells uh, that we're gonna talk about. Um, here's some stars. So I want you to know those ones there. Uh, we're not really gonna talk too much about basophils or neutrophils, but we're gonna talk about lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are going to be uh, next day's lecture. That's the B cells and T cells. So I'll write that down, B and T cells. Or more accurately, people call them B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. Uh, we're gonna talk about macrophages and eosinophils, and we've already talked about the dendritic cells which are involved in phagocytosis. So notice a bunch of these are involved in cellular killing. So we've got uh, phagocytosis killing and non-phagocytosis killing. So I'm gonna talk about those now. So let's talk about phagocytosis. Uh, mentioned a few times kind of this semester, uh, here and there, and kind of wanna look at it in some detail here. So this word here, phago, means eating, right? So we've, we've seen that before. We were talking about bacteriophage. It's the same root word to mean eating. And site means cell and osis means the process of. So this is the process of eating, uh, the process of cellular eating, right? So it says here, basically in phagocytosis, a phagocyte, so site means cell. So this means a cell that can undergo phagocytosis. So it will engulf uh, and destroy some sort of invader. Now this is how some cells eat, like amoeba. They go around and they, they find food and eat this way, right? Uh, dendritic cells, they go around and they're like, I said, they're like watchdogs and they, they go around and they grab things and, and sample them to, to figure out whether we need to alert other parts of the immune system. So let's take a look at the process um, of phagocytosis in a little bit of detail. First part is something called chemotaxis, and that means that uh, the cell is moving, um, it's attracted to something. So when we have a puncture in our skin, let's say you uh, get scratched by a thorn or something like that, um, there are chemicals called histamines that are released, and those histamines will actually attract phagocytes. They say, hey, there's some damage here, can you come and uh, can you come check things out? I want, to, I want you to clean up uh, uh, some bacteria that you find, so please come over. So these chemicals, like I said, they attract it. And you can see in this case here, you've got this uh, immune cell, it's moving along uh, very much like an amoeba. It's extending its cytoplasm, uh, making those pseudopodia and, uh, and, and moving towards the, uh, the signal. So once it gets there, it's going to attach. And you can see we've got, um, here's the pseudopod right there. And uh, um, I think we talked about pseudopods before. Pseudo means fake. And podia or pods, pods is, uh, is plural. Podia is plural. Pseudopod is one, yeah, pseudopodia is plural. Um, so it, it means feet, right? So false feet. I'll write that in there. So false feet. So those are just, that's just the cytoplasm extending 
and uh, kind of going around and, uh, and engulfing the organism. Uh, so we mentioned that some organisms um, are relatively resistant to this if they have capsules or slime layers, and uh, so um, the immune cell has a hard time grabbing onto them. So after the attachment, you've got ingestion. So it makes, uh, it makes something called a phagosome. So zome kind of means a body or an object, right? So something that's been formed by phagocytosis. And then that is going to fuse with a lysosome. So you may remember way back, I think it was lecture one or two, we talked about cell parts and we talked about lysosomes. So that was on the, uh, on the quiz way, way back in the second week of classes. And uh, this is why you need to know that because this is a, uh, an organelle that contains digestive enzymes. It's actually acidic, just like a stomach. So you, it's, it's, uh, you can think of it as cellulose stomach. So it fuses with the phagosome. And what happens when it fuses, it releases those digestive enzymes and uh, whatever was in there is gonna get broken down. So after that, so immune cells are not doing this for food, right? Immune cells are doing this to destroy things, right? And um, there's different ways they, they can do this, but um, often in the end, they will actually release some of the parts of the, uh, of the killed pathogen. Some of them get released into the blood uh, or into the lymph. Some of them actually get attached to the surface of the immune cell. So this has a, a term, it's called antigen presentation. So I kind of, like I said, think of, the, think of your dendritic cells as watchdogs, right? And you can picture, you know, in some sort of uh, funny Disney movie, you got a watchdog and the, and the dog comes and grabs, uh, you know, and, and, and it grabs a piece of the guy's pants who's trying to rob the, the bank or whatever. And um, so, and then when the police show up, you know, they see the, the guard dog standing there and in its mouth, it's got the piece of the guy's pants. So I kind of think of, of antigen presentations like that, right? Because you've got this immune cell, it grabs the pathogen and some parts of the pathogen it holds on to and, uh, and, and, and basically uh, has it on the surface of the cell. And uh, this is so that other immune cells can come along and, and read the signals and say, hmm, is this something to be concerned of or not? And so other, other immune cells are gonna come along and kind of do that kind of thing. Uh, so its job is to not necessarily recognize this, this um, uh, it's not necessarily gonna recognize this uh, uh, pathogen, but like I said, that's the job of the other parts of the immune system. Um, somebody's asking about neutrophils. Yeah, I see neutrophils is on this, on this slide. Yeah, don't, don't worry about neutrophils. Now, like I said, there's just too many cell types to concern ourselves with. We can't cover them all. So here's some images of phagocytosis happening, kind of in action. You can see there's some, um, some bacteria that are being uh, uh, consumed and destroyed by phagocytosis. And you can see a yeast cell. So I think the most incredible thing about this uh, yeast cell is how big it is compared to the uh, immune cell. It's almost the same size. So there is a limit though. Uh, these immune cells can't just uh, you know, destroy things that are larger than them. And that's gonna happen a lot if you think about larger pathogens. Um, there's all sorts of pathogens that have massive cells. There's some pathogens, of course, like worms, they're multicellular, and our immune cells can't kill everything by phagocytosis. So that's why we're gonna talk about non-phagocytotic killing as well, which is another uh, mechanism the immune system has. So here's uh, another diagram from the textbook, and you can see it's talking about all sorts of macrophages uh, or phagocytes of the body. A macrophage, again, it's just, a, it's just another name for a cell that can do phagocytosis. There's a whole bunch of them. A lot of them have specialized names for their tissues, uh, like Langerhans cells is another name for dendritic cells. I can't even remember which tissue that's in. Here's our dendritic cells down there at the bottom, right there. And uh, so some of these you may learn in some of your other courses eventually. I'm not going to go into all the names of all these things. There's just too many. But like I said, usually they're, they're given special names for special tissues in many cases. So like I said, sometimes there are cells or infections or things our immune system is going to deal with that are too large to kill by phagocytosis. So we call this non-phagocytotic killing. Um, this includes a number of things. So I'm going to make a little list for you of things that this might include, and we'll come back to this list a number of times. So we're talking about large parasites, so like worms, large parasites. You can write worms beside that, I just don't have enough room. 
We're also talking about tumors. That's right, our immune system can recognize uh, cells that have uh, started to form tumors. And so this is great, our immune system can protect us against uh, uh, many cancers. Uh, and then the third type are cells infected by viruses. So cells infected by viruses. So this means basically we have our own cells, right? Our own cells are, are too big to kill by phagocytosis in, in most cases. And uh, the good news is our immune system can recognize them and it can deal with them. So if you take a look on the right, we have um, a tumor cell, which is much larger than our immune cell. And we have a, a cell called a, a killer cell. Some kills are natural killers. I know it sounds like they're homicidal. Uh, it just means they don't need to be activated by other immune cells, right? We, um, just like anybody who's doing any killing, uh, we don't want too many of them. So there's some that are natural and just kind of ready to go. Uh, again, kind of like guard dogs, they're, they're active and ready to go and recognize these things and attack, uh, but we don't want too many of them. Uh, so there are some cells that are non-natural killers. Uh, so you can see what's going on here is, is there's, a, there's a few different mechanisms that they do this, by the way, and I'm not gonna get into all these mechanisms, uh, but basically what they do is um, they uh, attach to the target cell, so they recognize it in some form or another. And like I said, there's multiple mechanisms and you can kind of think of it as the kiss of death. So this one here, you can see that it's full of these little toxins. Oops, it's full of these little toxins in here and these little toxins are gonna get released to the uh, target cell and they're gonna kill the target cell. So like I said, many, many mechanisms. I don't wanna kind of focus on those mechanisms. It can also induce something called apoptosis. Again, something I'm not gonna talk about in this class. So here's those eosinophils and you can see these are full of these, um, these toxins, and these ones are specialized for killing worms, worm type parasites. And uh, I'll show you a diagram here, or an image here in a moment. So there's a fluke. Fluke is a massive worm, and so one cell is not gonna be enough. So we got those, those eosinophils, and they're attacking it, and, uh, and they're gonna kill that thing. They're just in, uh, releasing all these toxins, which are gonna rupture the membrane, and this thing is gonna die. So let me just go back one slide here. You may have noticed this extra note here, right? Um, these things are involved in the same part of your immune system that is dealing with allergies. So um, there is some overlap between um, uh, that part of the immune system. And so it turns out that people, uh, particularly people in developing countries who are exposed to uh, parasitic worms and, and uh, um, other parasites, uh, they don't usually have allergies. Uh, people in, uh, in countries that uh, you know, aren't experiencing these things, the number of allergic diseases are a lot higher because that part of the immune system it has, uh, it's just kind of bored. And uh, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the immune system. So there's a couple of questions. Someone asked me to release the slideshow notes. Yeah, I'll do that. I just finished, uh, finished them this morning. And someone's asking, and says, so can we have cells in our body that become cancerous like every day? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Basically every day, uh, your immune system is, uh, that's what the evidence shows that uh, probably daily your immune system is clearing cells that could be potentially cancerous, um, which is why it's more likely you get cancer with time. Eventually, eventually some of those cancer cells are gonna be selected that are gonna find ways to evade the immune system. And never mind, as you get older, your immune system is, is, uh, is it gets weaker as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of scary to think about that, that we're breeding cancer right now. Uh, and uh, um, you know, the stats are that uh, about 45% of us will have cancer in our lifetime. And uh, so it's something that we, we should certainly take very seriously. Okay, there's those eosinophils uh, killing the fluke. Like I said, also kind of relevant if you have allergies, these things get a little bit overactive, so that's not good. So more on allergies um, um, when, we, when we get back from the break. So lots of chemical defenses in the blood are similar to the ones we talked about in other areas, so lysozyme, defensins. I wanna talk very briefly about the complement system and very briefly about interferons. Um, both of these things um, on the final exam, the most you'll have is one multiple choice or true and false question. I'm not going to uh, go into these things in a lot of detail because uh, it just takes too much time that we don't have and they're very, very complex things. 
but I'll show you what they are because they do come up when you read and talk about the immune system, they pop up again and again and again. So let's talk about the complement system first. So the complement system is a whole bunch of proteins and, uh, and these proteins can trigger other immune responses. So they can trigger these things that we've already talked about or we're gonna talk about. So things like phagocytosis, they can trigger uh, killing of a pathogen, they can trigger uh, inflammation and fever, right? So uh, if you read in the textbook, it talks about them setting off uh, something called a molecular cascade. And uh, people are probably thinking, what's a cascade again? Well, this is a cascade, right? So a cascade is where you have uh, one thing leads to another thing, which leads to another thing, which leads to another thing and so on. And so you can see these nice little uh, waterfalls showing that kind of thing where you have one waterfall leads to the next one and so on. So I'll show you from the textbook again. I don't expect you to know this and there's some nice pictures in the textbook that kind of go through this detail, but you can see this, this uh, uh, series of events, right? We've got an antibody, it binds a virus, right? So this activates complement one. Complement one activates complement two and four. Two and four combine to make complement three. Complement three activates complement five, which activates six, seven, eight, nine. And so each time this happens, there's kind of an amplification, right? So if you think about complement one activates two complement twos and complement two, act, every complement two activates two complement fours and so on, um, you get this amplification. So in the end, what does this mean? It means we have a system for uh, amplifying your immune response. So kind of turning it up a little higher and leading to the killing of the pathogen, which is usually the, the end goal. So this is kind of the, the textbook picture. You can see we've got all these proteins and these proteins all activate each other. And this leads to all of these, uh, all of these other immune responses, some we haven't talked about yet, right? So I know there's a picture here which is showing the uh, uh, one consequence of the complement system is uh, getting, um, getting these toxins released and killing something. This is called a membrane attack complex. I don't know a lot about the membrane attack complex, but you can see it's forming all these pores. You can see they're all over the place in whatever this pathogen is. It's just full of holes. And the one on the right, you can see that the, the, the bacillus there is a nice rod shape. And then afterwards, the cell is just like absolutely mutilated from um, this attack complex. So complement system, no definition of that, right? It's a bunch of proteins found in the blood that will activate other other immune uh, reactions. So what are interferons? Again, I don't want you to know a lot about them, uh, or you can know lots about them, but uh, most it would be like one multiple choice or true false in the final. Um, these are basically antiviral proteins. And there's a bunch of different ones, and you may hear about interferon therapy and things like that. Again, I'm not gonna talk about that in this class. It just gets a little complicated. But you can see that uh, this, these are, are happen um, when a virus infects a host, itself, a host cell, um, these interferons can get released and they activate other immune responses. So kind of like the complements, but this is in response to a viral infection. So you can see this example, it says activate natural killers. So natural killers will come and recognize this as a virally infected cell and they're gonna come and give it the kiss of death. Uh, sometimes it can activate things like uh, inflammation, and uh, often uh, it, will, it will activate, um, I think it, it, uh, some of them actually interact with the hypothalamus so that you, people will get uh, headaches and fevers when, when uh, they have virus infections due to this response. There are interferons that do other weird things. Um, some interferons will bind uh, double-stranded RNA. And uh, of course, double-stranded RNA is not a normal thing that we find, but some viruses have double-stranded RNA. So somebody's mentioning her head might explode soon, so hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a lot of, uh, uh, it's a lot of stuff, right? Uh, and which is why I'm kind of trying to focus on certain things and not give you everything else. Uh, but uh, yeah, and you'll find um, the adaptive immune system is, is I, I think, is even more interesting when we start to talk about antibodies and things like that. And, and you will see some of these things in your anatomy physiology class, which will hopefully help. So let's talk about inflammation and fever. And um, these are um, some important processes uh, that are a response to sometimes infection, sometimes just tissue damage. Uh, so inflammation is uh, kind of a non-specific response to tissue damage. And uh, so you can have um, tissue damage from quite a number of things, right? You can get a sunburn and you get some inflammation. You can get a scratch 
you get some inflammation. You get a pimple if you get an inflammation. Um, pathogens can cause inflammation. So um, inflammation, I know, is often considered you know, to be a bad thing. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. What you're seeing is uh, uh, you're seeing a little bit of redness and you're seeing, uh, you know, it gets kind of warm and it's tender. But what it is is your body trying to send in blood and immune cells to heal, right? And, and acute inflammation is a good thing, right? And uh, somebody's asking what the picture is. I don't know. I just Googled inflammation. I just assumed it was a pimple or something. But um, it looks like it could be a little infection as well. And you can see a little bit of pus in there, I suppose. Uh, chronic inflammation or systemic inflammation can be bad. Uh, so chronic uh, can lead to uh, basically other tissue damage like arthritis. Systemic inflammation can lead to, uh, you know, uh, fevers and uh, low blood pressure and, and uh, can lead to, um, you know, in some cases, uh, uh, that's basically what you're having when you have septic shock. Uh, and in some cases can lead to death as well. So, so not so good. So I, got, I know I have a picture here showing what's happening with the inflammatory response. And I have another picture as well. And you can see that uh, one of the big things is it's just the body trying to deliver blood and oxygen and immune cells to that uh, damaged tissue. And so how does it do this? Well, when you get that tissue damage, histamines are released. And histamines open up those blood vessels and, uh, and bring in all the recruits. So there's a little bit of a better picture here on the next slide. Okay, I wasn't thinking about this slide, but I was thinking about the next one, but you can see there's the uh, immune cells, they're coming, and uh, you can see that uh, the tissues are more porous, and it's allowing fluid and, and immune cells to kind of come in there and, and arrive, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, help with the healing process and, and defend against any bacteria. So I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, this is the picture I was thinking about that I thought was first, but I guess it's last. You can see there's the tissue damage. You can see there's the mention here that histamines are being released right here. Histamines are all over the place here and the histamines are causing the uh, blood vessels to dilate and allowing those immune cells to get in there. And of course, with that puncture, this person has some bacteria. And so you've got all sorts of things coming along like dendritic cells. Uh, we've got platelets that are gonna be important for any blood clotting. And um, so inflammation is usually a good thing. So like I said, the thing about inflammation is you don't like it when it lasts too long. And uh, you know, inflammation is characterized by, by these symptoms, you know, the acronym SHARP, right? Swelling, heat, redness, pain. The P can also stand for pus as well. So inflammation, usually a good thing. We're gonna talk about those histamines. Of course, uh, some people with allergies probably are familiar with histamines and you treat them with antihistamines. And that's when we have histamines that are kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more systemic. And, you know, they can cause, you know, some discomfort like, you know, eye watering and, and, uh, and, and things like that. And so sometimes we can reduce inflammation by uh, taking antihistamines. So kind of one of the last things here for today is fever. Uh, and again, something I'm not going to cover in a lot of detail. Uh, fever is... Um, uh, basically an elevated body temperature and uh, you know so our, our body temperature is like 37 degrees or 38 39 degrees uh, you know you've got some sort of fever and uh, this is caused by our immune system that's recognizing a bunch of things so one thing i don't have on this list of course is the interferons i should write that one down Although, like I said, I'm not going to ask you probably much, if anything, about interferons, but it is on that list. Um, some things we talked about last day that can cause fever, endotoxins. So part of the outer membrane of gram negatives. Um, there's other toxins. So these are things that our immune system recognizes as something that's not normal. And I'm not exactly sure what the mechanism is, uh, but uh, things that can cause fever are called pyrogens. pyrogens. So pyro, kind of like making a fire. And, uh, uh, and another immune responses can lead to fever. So uh, when an antibody recognizes something, uh, sometimes particles released by macrophages and, and so on. So how does a fever help? Well, a fever inhibits the growth of some microbes. And uh, if you know anything about chemistry, right? Uh, reactions are sped up by heat. 
So basically we're adding a little bit of heat to our body and that's gonna enhance everything. It's gonna enhance our tissue repair. It's gonna enhance our, our white blood cells can move a lot faster. There's been studies, believe it or not, uh, you know, looking at white blood cells moving and they, they move quite a bit faster, apparently at 38 degrees than 37 degrees. Um, so fever can be good. Uh, it can help us, you know, kind of deal with that, deal with that um, uh, pathogen. Uh, of course, they're uncomfortable. Maybe, you know, we can't sleep so well. In some cases, extreme fevers can be very dangerous as well. And so, uh, you know, mild fevers, you know, usually the recommendation is just leave it. Uh, serious fevers, obviously treat it. And again, sometimes it's just a matter of comfort and things like that. Uh, you know, uh, I find when I'm sick and I have a fever, uh, I can't sleep. So sometimes the sleep is, is more important than having a fever. Um, I mentioned that fever too high can be damaging. And, uh, and we're starting to see the last 10 or 20 years kind of different opinions on whether fever should be treated. I'm starting to see a lot of MDs are saying, don't treat fevers unless they're at, and then they have some temperature they think is important. Um, and because they, they do help us, uh, you know, get rid of, they help our immune system get rid of whatever it is uh, that's, that's bothering us. Uh, and then, you know, because it used to be the, the wisdom 20 years ago, it used to be, you know, got a fever, give them a Tylenol right now. Um, so, like I said, varying opinions on those kind of things. Okay, um, that's actually the end of this topic. And uh, I know there's a few minutes left. I'm not going to use them up. I know I have filled some brains to the brim and maybe even then some. So um, we'll just finish off early today. Uh, so before I finish, I got a couple of things to say. Don't forget your assignment if you have not handed that in. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, do my best to get started on them in the next few days. And um, last thing to say is uh, don't forget that Thursday is the reading days. So there's no class on Thursday. So I will see you next Tuesday. There's a couple of questions here. Someone's asking if, if I have a practice final exam. Um, no, I don't have a practice final exam. Uh, it's a lot of work to put one together. I'm not sure if I will be able to do so uh, for that. Um, the final exam is, is uh, hopefully no surprises. It should be uh, you know, very similar to the midterms, just different material. Uh, but maybe someday I will see what I can do about putting a practice final together. I just, there's, I, I think it's very unlikely for me to do that this particular semester. Uh, somebody's asking about a study guide for the written questions. Um, my study questions at the end of my notes are my study guide. So those are the questions to uh, take a look at. Make sure you look at those study questions for sure. Okay, so that's all for today, unless there are no other questions. We will see you next week. I hope you enjoy the break and that you get caught up on things.